to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Juliet Stoltenkamp. She's the director of the Center for Innovative Education, Communication and Technologies. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Just let me know if you can see my screen, Paul. Yes, yes we can. can. Yes, we can, thank you. I'll turn off my video. Good morning, um, colleagues. And I would like to thank um, Professor Daniels for giving me the opportunity to share on, on this podium. And uh, Prof Daniels, you've put me in a spot, my nerves to present after the DVC. So um, I hope I can um, pull that shoes as well. Well, I know um, you could rise to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, thank you for allowing us to engage um, in the scholarship of engagement and internationalization. And I would like to um, start by saying that I'm going to focus specifically on how online environments impact the scholarship of engagement and the scholarship of internationalization. And uh, Miller Young um, emphasizes that, um, and Prof um, alluded to this as well, we are living in this new digital age. So we need to generate new knowledge integration and as well as to apply or disseminate knowledge. And so my first part of my presentation will um, focus on online envi environments and specifically on scholarship of engagement. And um, I think I'll start there. I'm going to give you some authentic um, evidence. Um, I think I like to do that while, whilst we engage. For example, there's Pr Pr Priscilla Daniels and her team, the Community Leadership Program since 2014. We created an online environment for this environment. And um, Priscilla and team definitely wanted to focus on transformational leadership and management around ethics, emotional intelligence, and stakeholder engagement. So for a long time, they thought of how to make it a global environment. So we created a, this environment, we designed an interactive online environments, and they had to model the behavior because if they were going to encourage a leadership styles, types and qualities of transformation for the community, they had to think about these environments they need to create as well. And this is um, in alignment uh, what, what Prof spoke about earlier. We're speaking about these 21st century citizens, but we need to see that our students through teaching methodologies engage both locally and globally. We're speaking about curriculum transformation, but we need to create these environments so that they can um, teach, learn, and live within these spaces now. This is becoming more and more um, um, applicable. And here's another um, authentic example. We have um, UWC and Stellenbosch University students from various disciplines. In a, in a course called a IPE World Cafe Forum. And they engage actually in interprofessional groups in a case. The lecturer would break them into groups. So we had occupational therapy and psychology students and they were given a case. And then they had to discuss an intervention. So they have a role and each discipline in their group, you know, so they took their roles as individuals, but then also got together in a group. And it's amazing how the students across um, these disciplines were able to engage with the case. So that again, um, in alignment with our draft um, IOP, um, or no, that was our white paper 2016 to 2020, we, we said that we're going to explore innovative ways of sharing and disseminating. How are we actually um, applying it so we've seen throughout the week, various lecturers um, present as well, but how are we going to do it for our partnerships as well? As Prof said, it can't just be about research. We have to think about um, our teaching as well. And um, you would have heard some of you, um, Henriette presented yesterday, the Center for Performing Arts. And I think about people thinking about new ways of teaching 
Henriette has been one of them. How was she going to deliver online music practicals and final sense assessments during this COVID time? So this is where we partnered with um, Henriette Weber. And definitely thinking about the blended arrangements around it. So the students engage in practicals via Google Meet, WhatsApp. And then some of them even came to the, to the um, CPA, uh, to, to the center. But students were able to do the exams from home in real time. So this is a big shift. So here we, we, we assisted Henriette. So the lecturer provides theory in alignment with the weekly themes and assessments. And then also linking your tests and quizzes, your continuous assessment to master the knowledge and skills. And I think this is definitely in alignment with, if we're going to speak about promoting responsiveness and enabling students to improve their learning ability, and to increase their chances of excelling in their studies. And that for me was, was, was a, a lecturer who actually applied um, in alignment with this um, IOP. We have, for example, a, a course in computer science and um, the lecturer would invite guest lecturers from various organizations to weekly seminars. And then the students have to engage in reflective summaries related to the weekly seminars. So look how those students are allowed to engage with, with other speakers as well. And in, in the nanoscience program, so we have presenters from various countries, South Africa, Spain, France, Ireland, and they co-lecture within this course. So you see how you can create environments for people to co-lecture. And um, again, thinking about not a dumping site, as I've emphasized always, so we would assist the lecturer to um, create themes, topics, to structure the online environments. And um, I think you might be aware already that we need to influence each other's work towards shared goals in the classroom, in the curriculum. And this is how these debates have been going on since the first, um, um, uh, Vanessa Brown also had a colloquium on, on Tuesday. And already there was an, a lot of focus on the curriculum, the new design, but how are we going to um, transform these curriculums for our own dis disciplines and also when it goes out into the pub public sphere. So there's a module in a CHS, it's a shared research module, and students from various disciplinary gr uh, groups engage in this module. Again, the lectures are structured aligned to outcomes and it includes uh, lecture presentations and activities. So again, the lecturer had to think about engaging the students. So there's live lectures and there's interaction via the big blue button. And then consider um, some of the live lectures had to be done via the big blue button because you were thinking about data as well. And you know that the Canva has been zero rated so we try to integrate the big blue button into the environment. So we were thinking, thinking about these communities when they need to engage in these online environments and we need to consider resources and we need to think of ways of making it easy for the people to actually engage in these environments. We have a, a, a law course for quite some time and I think they were quite ad, um, advanced and, and Prof Lavak would be proud of, uh, about this. Um, the, the new global market, um, we had to have online compulsory uh, workshops during weekends and it was Prof Darcy Tatoy, uh, Prof Lavak years ago and as when he left, the, the, uh, the lecturers just continued um, engaging in, in, in the school. So that has been around and it gives you an example of how lecturers have been thinking about creating these global environments. Um, Cornell, I don't know if you can see that this, okay, here we go. Yes. Are you still able to see my screen? Mm, looks good. Okay, hold on. So they also have to submit online assessments, assignments, tests and quizzes, and they discuss case studies. Now I'm moving into my next um, 
section, the scholarship of internationalization and how online environments actually impact that. Again, I will provide some authentic evidence. And um, this quote says, there's a growing demand for and recognition of internationalization at home, including internationalization of the curriculum, teaching and learning and learning outcomes. And I think Prof. Lavat was emphasizing that earlier. So the Dula um, Omar Institute contacted us uh, well, as well, contacted us as well. Mm -hmm. They have a one month self-paced online course and uh, the students had to engage for that period. So it's part of the Committee of Experts on the Rights and Wealth of Child um, conducted online sessions and they created um, an interactive environment. We assisted, us, assisted them. And participants from across the African continent engaged in discussion forums and actually completed online tests. And again, um, they have their topics aligned to, to, to themes and there was a scaffolded approach releasing the content on, on, on a weekly basis. Um, internationalization is understood as a process and focus on incorporating international, intercultural and global dimensions into education, research, and service to society. Again, that emphasis, we can't separate these aspects. We have a collaborative online winter school. So universities in Europe and Africa, so South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, and Germany. So we, we worked with CHS and we created this online winter school for them. And there's also guest lecturers that are coming into this classroom via Zoom, and then there's also a link accessible via Ecumba. So they access their Zoom lessons, they engage in asynchronous communication discussions, and that's um, very interesting. And um, you would know this one already, it was marketed as well uh, for a few years now, our fully online courses for EMD, SMD with, within um, the EMS faculty. And they are, um, promoting these students on the national and international students, and they're completing this course remotely. So we can see more and more how fully online environments are being created and people are contacting the C team to help them. We help them to design and develop these environments. Um, I spoke as well yesterday, uh, Prof. Daniels, on giving your, your, your learner um, that scaffolded approach, but also checking on them. Even sometimes adult learners, they get a checklist, they need to complete weekly themes and topics. So you need to create that interactive environment for them. Work in progress, so exciting. Uh, there's a postgraduate diploma in interprofessional education, and we're working with, with those lecturers. UWCN and international stakeholders collaborate and uh, to design and develop the program. And Within Ecamba, you can also start linking other social learning tools. This is a flip grid and the lecture is making a use of this. And so as you embed other tools within Ecamba, you can see the educational value and it also assists with peer-to-peer -peer learning. So these are also becoming very important to think about other tools that can be integrated into your environment. And then we spoke about partnerships. We have a partnership with Learning Science UK and UWC. And this was an example of um, Prof. Daniels where it wasn't just a partner that came with the tool and we signed an agreement, but we actually sat with them and they understood our needs. We worked with the lecturers to create the online environments. And then we embedded our, um, our, our developers embeds these simulations into Ecamba. And we have, um, so the science uh, faculty and in collaboration with the seat won the award because these simulations, um, they, they haven't seen it being used um, at this rate. UWC 43,473 times for the chemistry lab um, assessments and in 2021, 28,944 times for the um, assessments as well for the learning science, bioscience resources. So this was a partnership where you just don't think of a partner coming in, dumping 
some light onto us, you know, as if we don't know, but actually sitting with us and then we giving a methodology of how we are going to implement it. And that's worked um, wonders. So they also support the tutorial sessions with practical assignments. And then we also link it to turn it in for academic honesty. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost, and I'm coming to an end now. There was a, 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 um, a course, UWC and the University of Florida. So we designed an interactive environment for them, entrepreneurship empowerment in South Africa. And it went well, 2012 to 2018. And then because they did a lot of physical fieldwork exercises, it couldn't continue. And this is where we start telling the lecturers, you need to rethink and redesign. You know, how are we going to rethink activities and practical field work? And that's already happening. We have a work in progress with one of our um, geology modules. I think some of you saw that. So our developers are integrate virtual reality. So this, the students go into the field virtually. So these are ways of, of, of expanding our, our, our horizons. So yes, um, I've, I've come to an end uh, Prof. Daniels, but I'd like to say that um, we must create multiple diverse practices to establish real world learning opportunities with our communities. And I know um, it seems like I'm just mentioning it one after the other. Um, I need to say, like uh, as I said yesterday, it takes a lot of effort on behalf of the team and the subject matter experts, you know, um, I respect them so much, the lecturers that engage with us and then actually apply the skills and, and, and it's all about the student. And I think that's very important. So I will stop there, Paul. Thank you, Juliet. Again, that was pretty much amazing. Uh, you and your team do amazing work. Um, so right now, I would like to invite everybody to participate in, in questions for Prof. Levac as well as for Julie Head. Questions, discussions. If I look at the, the chat board, I see that Samuel said, listening to Prof. Levac reminds me that we are a multifaceted institution. We have a local and a global identity. So please, everybody, you're, you're welcome to raise your hand or put uh, questions or um, make comments within the chat box as well. Oh. Yes, go ahead. Can I just respond to Juliet's uh, presentation and just to thank her? Um, I, I think it's really big, uh, the whole thing of um, creating experiential uh, learning experiences online for our students. Um, on the one side, it's, it's quite challenging uh, because experiential learning um, requires interaction. And, um, and that is a challenge online. So Juliet's vision in terms of creating experiential learning experiences um, creates knowledge construction. And um, if we look at what is learning and what is learning online, learning online is knowledge construction. And it actually can only take place through uh, uh, learning experiences, to create learning experiences. So uh, what you just shared with us is, is uh, from a teaching and learning point of view, it's, uh, it's massive, it's big, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you very much. I see uh, Henry Hett also placed something in the, in the chat box. She said, thank you, Juliet, for acknowledging the CPA Music Online. Thank you for your support in creating this platform, especially Terence hands on engagement. Prof. Levac. Maybe just two comments. The one is to ask Juliet that I really enjoyed your presentation. Do you, do you have, do we have a, um, not a list, but a, uh, an understanding of how many of our online programs are actually globally connected? That would be very interesting um, statistics to see. Do we, do we know? How many they are? You gave us very nice examples of, of, of some of them today. That's the one. And then just to say that I'm, I'm so excited about the CPA online music education because it just 
shows us the the possibilities of even internationalizing our, mu our music curriculum and having even people from elsewhere take part in the teaching of, of our music and our performing arts, uh, budding performing arts program. So I just want to make those two comments. So Prof, I think um, we'll, we'll create that list and then we'll continuously update, you know, as we start going through everything. Um, um, yeah. But yeah, I can can I just wanted to thank Prof Lovac for setting the scene uh, um, for how we we approach the uh, scholarship of engagement and and uh, internationalization and for reminding us of the four aspects of of our, our policies that guide us. But also, I think it's important that you highlighted some of the 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 ideas. Um, because one of the things that we have been talking about that we want to expand when we do the colloquium is about uh, the how do we navigate getting all our partners to work together. Um, and so the time zones become important and working out our, our uh, partnerships and how we're going to do it. And I think linking to what... what um, uh, the examples that Julia did in terms of you know, there are various ways. I like the idea of getting different present, uh, presenters like we did when we were working with the University of Missouri. So it's quite possible that one can have that um, uh, connection and discussion and the internationalization at home. And I think that that's one of the things we have to explore is how do we use um, our platforms to, to expand internationalization at home. So I don't even talk a little bit more about that, Prof. I, I think maybe at another instance, I could, I could expand a bit more um, on internationalization at home because um, Anita Morton and I have, uh, have done um, the research on that and presented, I think, in, in Portugal a couple of years okay. ago on internationalization at home and how one can build a framework for the university. And I think it's something that, Maybe we should be presenting at um, maybe at the colloquium. Okay, that would be great, Prof. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Cornell, I believe you want to say something. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Paul, and and thanks, colleagues. You know, uh, I was just listening when Juliet was presenting and thinking back of so many years ago how she laid a foundation for me. And early this morning, we spoke about just before the event started, about the, the entire team, how they've always been there for us and how they've been more than there for us um, since lockdown. But I think what was really valuable for me was um, with Prof. Lebach, with your, with your keynote, and, and yes, we will make available definitely your PowerPoint and uh, for people to, to even just listen to your keynote address. Um, because I think for me, a lot of dots connected with what you said today. You know, we have so many things going on on campus with the CHE review that's coming up, the decolonization of curriculum, the internationalization, then this globalization and smaller world and being more engaged and understanding that it's a scholarship of engagement. It's not just research, like you said. And so I've, I've been sitting for quite a couple of months now with all these sort of, I thought, priorities. And at the same time, how do we action our new IOP when it kicks in in our next strategy? Um, and I think from what you've indicated to say, but actually look at how Fees Must Fall actually gave us a cue there already. And just as we sort of started grappling with realizing that we must engage more with our student community so that we can be better academic or campus community members and only then can we start being engaged in making a meaningful contribution to society and send our graduates back home. So I'm hoping that we can share this keynote of yours um, on more platforms after today because I think it's going to help a lot of us as campus community just to connect the dots. And part of what you've said, I even want to use with my um, students in the community development degree, because I really, really think that just 
connects us all. So I felt connected and I felt engaged. So thanks for that, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you. I don't mind if it's shared. Um, definitely not. We did make a recording, so it would be fine. Henriette, sorry, I missed uh, that message from you. You can you can respond. Thank you, Paul. Um, the, thank you so much, Juliet, for um, the contribution about uh, in your presentation on the CPA, because the intervention that has happened um, since April in 2020, when we started the process with CIECT, um, the engagement with us, with the, first of all, between Terence and the staff was instrumental in the foundation for that success. It was ongoing, it was interactive. As we uh, engaged with the process, we all learned through that process. But it wasn't only for the staff, it was how it impacted our students, how we could um, make the world smaller within an online space, where an international uh, conductor, who was actually our examiner for our senior students, who was in Canada at the time, he's based at Northwestern University in Chicago, could examine a student at, who was at the Center for Performing Arts, as well as another student who is based in Kimberley. But her assessment was done in Bloemfontein. And in a normal situation where it was face-to-face, -face, that would have incurred traveling and cost. But we had a structured, well-organized, time differences and all we could create that space. The online theory, which was uh, crucial for the center because historically the theoretical subjects are neglected within community music. And it wasn't only the educational value of working on ICAMVA for the students, but we were able to, in this year in July, do a collaborative project with the uh, Protestant University of Applied Sciences in Bochum in Germany. We were using a different platform called Moodle, which is uh, the project for, for Bochum. But because of the interaction that our students had on ICAMVA, and this was a conversation I had with Terence this week, I said that transition was so smooth, but it was based on the fact that the training, our staff, the students, and they were confident to be able to engage on this platform. So Juliet, it is not just the platform, it is all the engagement, the support that staff, students, and the whole of the CPA um, has been able to learn from during this process. And it has really been um, a learning curve for all of us, but something that will be continuing throughout in blended learning post COVID-19. So thank you so much. Thank you, Henriette. Um, Paul, can I just add to that? And I think Henriette makes a um, very important point because, you know, we were speaking about yesterday as well about lifelong learning. So these skills that they attain, let's say through Ecamva, it then makes them very confident to engage in other platforms as well. You know, so we take for granted it's that, like Jelly Salmon's model, that first step of familiar, familiarization and socialization right up to the last step where they actually become self-directed learners. It's continuous assistance through all those steps and you'll be surprised how much they learn. We take for granted that they were maybe within one platform, how confident they become when they start engaging in other platforms as well. So that's a very important uh, point. Thank you, Henry. Thank you very much, Juliet. I'm not sure whether it is Vidosophus or Prof. Marichan, but can we go with Vidosophus and then Prof. Hi, good morning. Thank you, colleagues. My um, question or comment is directed to Prof. Levat. Prof. Levat, thank you so much. I attended your session at the so conference around governance. I found it very was very interesting. So it was also related. So when I thought about that, I'm thinking also in terms of community engagement at UWC, I must say that I did join the, um, the program where you talk late. I came from another meeting, so I got the tail end of your, of, your, of your presentation. But I want to ask you or to share your thinking around the governance issues around community engagement at the institution at UWC. So at the faculty level, um, 
as you know, in our faculty, we just um, we having or engaging the departments around establishing a faculty community engagement, um, clinical and community engagement and social impact um, committee. So, so in terms of how do you, what is your thinking in terms of how do we then take it through? Because we know we don't have a Senate community engagement um, committee. Um, so I'd like to share your thinking around the mm -hmm. governance around how do we institutionalize it at a UWC, at a, yeah, within a UWC institution. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that, 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 thanks for those. That's a very interesting question. What we're first doing now, and this will be an outflow of that process, is that um, Cornell and um, Brad Daniels um, are assisting me so that we can have a... Um, a community engagement strategy in a sense, because what we've done, we've, we've I think, hopefully firmly established the, the notion that we should have an integrated scholarship of engagement at DWC. But now how do you um, put that within a broader strategy or the cross cut of an anchor institution? And it's within the anchor institution strategy, the cross cutter that we will embed uh, the community engagement. But then we need to do it in such a way that we make it very explicit that it links with the other core missions. Otherwise, we're gonna have a separate, we should not be having a separate committee for community engagement. But in our Senate Learning and Teaching Committee, you raise a very important point. We should have a standing item on the integration of, and the possibilities of the integration of learning and teaching and community engagement where, we, where faculties in their temp, uh, the template that we have anyway has to change, where they can reflect on the community engagement part, where you have work, integrated learning experience, clinical education, et cetera, et cetera, that can be part of learning and teaching. But then you also have the possibility of in your research committees, in, in, in your faculty, to not only look at disciplinary research, but also look at the, the scholarship of engagement as a, um, of, of engaged research rather, um, and especially in the industry, I think, uh, and in, in CHS, for example, there's a, a wealth, you're sitting on all that data. In fact, the law clinic also, you're sitting on all of that data and there needs to be a translation of that data into, um, um, into engaged research. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I wouldn't think it would be wise to have a separate community engagement committee because that would actually um, be counterproductive to having this integrated scholarship of, of engagement. But you, you, you do, um, and I'm hoping that Cornell and Priscilla are listening, um, strengthen this point that uh, in our strategy anyway, and how it will find effect in our governance structures, both at faculty as well as um, at Senate, because our plan will be going to Senate because of the fact that it's so integrately um, uh, mm. uh, um, connected to, to in our academic project. So I, will, I hope that makes sense to you. Thank you, Prof. Prof van der Good morning, all. Um, actually, uh, Prof Levac um, um, emphasized what I was trying to or wanted to say. Um, I think the digital skills um, becomes integrated in how we engage with communities and with the world out there. Um, we've seen this year that our students were able to create their own platforms to have webinars where they in, invite um, stakeholders and they were able to manage it, to organize it. And that was a strength that was almost um, integrated into um, normal learning and teaching and not separate as a separate uh, aspect. And then also with, I'm very curious to see in the long term with the project we've done with Henriette Weber, um, how students will use the skills that they acquire during this process to engage further. And um, I like the idea that it becomes a part of our learning and teaching and not a separate part. Uh, Prof. Lovat, do you want to respond? And then Demoris, you'll go next. Yeah, maybe just a practical example of what we've done in zone learning at UWC. And I think this is the opportunity we now have at UWC to, 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 um, to link what we're doing around community engagement to the curriculum. 
So our entrepreneurial incubation space is actually an experiential learning space where our students um, uh, learn the entrepreneurial skills, mindset, uh, and, and those kind of attributes in a changing world of work. So we've got that, but it's linked to clinics. And because it's linked to the entrepreneurial law clinic at the moment, uh, small business clinic, um, as well as the new transmedia law clinic, we made sure that it's not separate. It, um, those students are actually taught formal modules. And I think that is maybe the way that we should consider the possibilities that we now have with curriculum transformation and renewal, that we, uh, that we have much more intentional, you know, such, such kind of, of programs and an intention are now linked to our curriculum. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we've got one more question from Damaris, and then after Damaris, we'll go straight to a tea break. But we would like to encourage everybody to put any questions and discussions in the chat group. Damaris? Good morning and thanks for the opportunity. I think the point that Prof. Lavak has made is so relevant is around the scholarship of engagement, because I see in the interprofessional learning space in the hospital settings. Um, I mean, I just had a question yesterday from the Stellenbosch students is why do I only speak to the U UWC students? And I said, no, I will speak to them as well, but my primary focus is to make sure that the students that carries the UWC name within the hospital setting carries out that name with pride. And for them it was, but we don't have this. Um, I follow up and I mentor um, students in, in wards, especially our pharmacy students. And many times, even our OT students will ask me, um, you know, can I, because for them, it's if they see somebody from UWC other than their peers, they actually appreciate that. So for me, the scholarship of engagement within the community setting is sometimes the point we miss. And so when we send our students out to our communities, whether it is the hospital community or clinic community or the community at large, is that we need to make sure that the learning experience, the research experience actually kind of complement the community experience as well. And that we don't do that without support. Thank you, Damaris. Um, so it's 10 o'clock now. We would like to do a virtual tea break and if we can have everybody back by 10.15. Thank you, everybody.
Good day, everybody. So I hope that we all had a nice cup of tea or coffee. Um, I would like to introduce our next uh, speaker as uh, Dr. Cornell Hart, um, BCD Program Coordinator, uh, Dr. Cornell Hart. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, colleagues, you'll have to bear with me as I swap screens quickly because I'm multitasking and we all know what happens with multitasking. So let's hope all of it works well for you. And so, um, yes, it's been a very interesting morning and I always thought let's carry on with the discussion <laughs> instead of doing what I think my presentation is a bit technical. But it's very important that when we talk about scholarship of engagement or just engagement in its totality, what is community engagement? There's lots of philosophical points. This morning session is so exciting about hearing how community engagement is going to be taken further um, and action now because it's always been an infused principle as, as our DVC also indicate. But there's sometimes this one small thing that we tend to in all the hustle and bustle forget. And that's what uh, Prof. Daniels always refers to as the rules of engagement. So I'm going to try and give a few facts, uh, but keep it not too academic. And I'm so glad to see in the audience, there's even some of the BCD, some of the Bachelor of Community Development students. As you know, it's our first year, so it's first year students. They started their academic career as students on campus, and I call it a career because it's lifelong learning. And they started it in a virtual university. But at the same time, I see there's some of our community members that we train in the substance misuse program, and some of them are here who also had to go online all of a sudden. So for me, the rules of engagement is so, so important when we we talk about engaging with the different communities, student communities, campus communities, civil society, all different partners. 
So what I want for us to look at this morning is to say, okay, if I talk rules of engagement, what is it really? Is it, is it just the rules or, or where does the rule sort of come from? It's not really rules per se as it's more values and principles. And so I want to touch specifically on what is it to have engagement values because it lies so close to what community development value system is because whether we call it community development or whether we call it community engagement, when the word community comes in, there should be a value system and there, there should be principles that guides us. But I also want to touch on the key features that, that engaged partnerships has and the next speaker, when Andriette speaks after me, she's actually going to make it all look good because she has all the components of what the principles was about, what the partnership key features is, how you extend the partnership out, it comes from local to international. And so that's why at the end, she is sort of the, the gate to and, and integration part of this morning session. But then, colleagues, I think just because we end off after a half-day program today, but after a wonderful week of an academic week, which I think is just fantastic that it's virtual because we could attend so many things between having classes and other meetings, I thought let's end off with what's the quality standards. Because if we say we have values and we have principles and we know what the features are of good partnerships and engaged partnerships, how do we prove it? And so for that, we need quality standards. So I'm going to start with what is community development values? And I want to show it as engagement values. When I engage with a community, whether it's a student community, civil society, or a combination of all of this, what is it that we must strive towards? What is it that, that grounds us in the value system? We do this so that we have equity and anti-discrimination. So this is a structural challenge that we focus on against inequalities. Then we have social justice. So we strive towards social justice, again, structural, but we look at the disadvantage part of what's happening that makes people be excluded and how do we advocate to overcome that. And then our third value that we work with is about the collective action. And colleagues, yeah, we learn every day as we work with each other. And as DVC indicated with this virtual world we went in, we realized how more challenging it is, although it's so wonderful to quickly connect anywhere in the world or with my colleagues through a virtual platform, how challenging it is to keep that connection, that collective action, so that it's active citizenry. In other words, I'm actively involved in what my human rights and my democracy tells. And then, of course, last but not second last from least is our empowerment. What is empowerment really? And we'll talk about that when I speak about the principles, because so often we think that sharing knowledge, just giving from my side to somebody else what I know that I now empower. I don't. Because if I just hand over information and not have a secular process where as I give, I receive, and the more I actually listen, the more empowered I am and the more empowered we are. So Prof. often refers to the co-creation, but I do remember as when she started as DVC, how she changed it around and said, it's learning and teaching. It's not teaching and learning. And that always struck support for me when we talk about empowerment. And then, of course, this working and learning together. So this is where we start co-creating between each other. And when we start doing that, we collectively in partnership towards social change. And then lastly, if we succeed with the previous five values, then this one is the one that says to us, it must be sustainable. It must be in balance with the planet, with culture, with society. And so if it's sustainable, it means we overcome 
the freedom of fear and the freedom of want. Freedom of want with basic needs, etc. Freedom of fear by not feeling inclusive, the othering as we deal with so much now in our uh, decolonization of our curricula. But colleagues, keep these six values in mind and then you'll see how they actually translate into the principles of community engagement, which I will touch on just after this slide. So what are the key features? If we say I have a successful partnership day, whether I have that partnership going with my students in the class, whether we as students and lecturers have it with our organizations or our practical platforms where we are, or if I just volunteer somewhere, what does it mean? It means that we share the same mission. So it starts in the classroom. Do we want to achieve the same? Do we agree with the curriculum? Are we having that foresight of what positive change we want to bring? And it translates from the classroom onto community um, of campus with my academic colleagues, with just friends, with other students that's not part of my academic program. And then at the same time, how do I do it when I practice my engagement? Because when I'm a community member, it's not just that I'm doing engagement when I'm at work. I must, it must be a way of life. And so communication is very important. Because if we don't keep it open and continuous about where we're going, what our initiative will drive us all about, then people can't, can't come on board. People can't grow. And Andrew it will show how their program started small and it just carried on growing. But it's because of good communication and, of course, because of good collaboration. So good collaboration, hmm, that's a dicey one all the time because we deal with all the differences. We deal with diversity issues, power dynamics, cultural diversity, racial, class, economic differences. And if COVID didn't teach us anything, then it taught us how diversity stared us in, in our face. Then we have support. There must be support for a project, and it must be from local leaders and stakeholders and community members, not just the target audience. Because if it's just for the group, the direct beneficiaries, and only they want it because we're doing it together, then it's not sustainable. And then it's not inclusive and it's not empowering because it's only for a specific group. Oh, and then one of the more difficult ones, how do I keep flexible when we say we have a vision, we have a plan, it must be organized, it must be structured, it must be all inclusive. Hmm. But now how do I keep that flexibility? It comes through that communication, that learning, keep thinking back about the values now of the previous slide. And then I'm able to maneuver, I'm able to stand back, I'm able to hear the voices, I'm able to be led by the people who wants it for the people. And so capacity pooling, hmm. we've learned through, even in COVID with our virtual university, we had to go in. We had to put whatever we had all in a hat. And it wasn't just financial resources. You've heard from uh, Dr. Stoldenkamp's uh, presentation, how they all had to just pull together as a small team and all of a sudden help students, academics, everybody. We had to make sure there's data available. We had to make sure there's better connectivity. And so, so many things was outside of our university control. But if we didn't have a sense of engagement with partnerships to find donors, to talk to the cell phone providers, et cetera, we would have stayed excluded and isolated. And of course, years back, one of the key features, empowerment. That partnership, that it must make a difference. And here again, number eight links back to the sixth value. It must be long-term. It must be a sustainable investment. Because if it's not long-term, then how will it generate capacity for the next generation? Then, colleagues, we keep on fixing the same thing, so to speak. And so how do we say that we really made an impact, social impact or what it's also called as broader impacts? It must be bigger and better than just the one place where I'm doing it. So I can't change the world, but each one of us can do our bit 
in a long-term and sustainable manner. And then in the end, we achieve the ninth feature of successful partnership, which is its well-being. Everybody achieves that freedom from fear, freedom from want, and it's possible. It's possible if all faculties and department staff say, my discipline focus on this, but I'm going to join hands with other disciplines, with other departments, and so we can make it happen together. But successful partnerships, good values, it doesn't go without the challenges. And so we need to know what we're up against so that we can hold on to our values and the principles that I will present now in order to achieve those nine successful features of a good partnership. And so probably one of our continuous and most impactful challenges that we face with is diversity. And so diversity has to do with many issues in South Africa because of our apartheid history. It's even worse because we sit with an institutionalized society that is still not embracing democracy, celebrating, feeling part of, owning the future. And so diversity plays itself out often that we don't even focus or that we're not even aware of sometimes when we have diversity issues. And so the same thing happens also between the international world. How do we fit as an African continent in a global world? How do we fit as a South African country in an African continent and then in a global world? And this is why decoloniality is almost more important than just decolonization. Because in decoloniality, we actually take on all the diversity issues that's done in a prejudiced way, that's done with a power dynamic that we struggle with all the time. And so power balance, probably one of the most challenging, continuous minute by minute that power dynamic shifts when we work as people. Because when we're in partnership colleagues, we need to admit we each come into a partnership because of What's in it for me? And we found that if we engage with, with prospective partners and we say, write cards on the table. Why are you here? What do you want out of this? It's then that you build that collective vision. It's then that you build a plan together. So all the values and principles come in just because we put our cards on the table. But we're often so scared to say, let's share what's in it for me. And that we then hear what's in it for us. And then the I goes to a we, and the we becomes the us. And that's what partnership should all be about. But again, here comes our history. So although diversity is a continuous challenge for us on a daily basis, because there's continuously new diversity aspects that comes to the fourth, and no matter what happens, if it's a COVID um, pandemic, we've seen that it showed in our face the great divide that we still sit between the have and the have nots. But at the same time, we have history. And so I am the end result of my past experience. We know that. But I can, from my history, make a concerted effort not to be the future result of my past experience. And then the fourth challenge is these assumptions. Oh my, oh my. If we don't work with assumptions, then we actually unlock better partnerships because we open. So here comes the issue of open and continuous communication. Do I understand you correctly? What is my diversity issues? Do I refer to people because of their hair color, because of their height, because of their social economic status? So colleagues, all these challenges and all the values actually intertwines. And that's why I said it's, it's quite a complicated topic to present. But I think if we unpack it a little bit with some key features of what's the challenges, what's the values, what's the principles, then we have a better idea as to how much time it's going to take us, what's the resources that we're going to need, and what's the logistics involved. So do we know? We can make a difference, but we need to be clear on the path that we're going to follow. So if we have the values 
and we have key features for success and we know what we're up against, what are our principles that grounds us? And so there's two slides, but it actually just provides for you the first four principles, which has to do with the community engagement process. And so what is the process about? The process is about we must be clear. And so if we are clear, and I think even my dog is now clear on that matter with clearing his ears, but apologies for the background noise. If we are clear with what is happening, then we can share a collective vision. We can move in a collaborative manner. So here comes those value systems and key features in a game. We become knowledgeable in the process, but even before the process, we must make the effort colleagues to understand culture, to understand the networks, to understand the power structures, the norms, the values, the history. So it's quite a heavy principle to say in the community engagement process, I must be knowledgeable because look at how many things I must be knowledgeable about. And then of course, I need to go to the community and establish relationships. So if I want to have good relationships with my student community, I must go, I must show up, I must stand up, I must step up. And the same thing, if our students want to own their future, want to have the graduate attributes to make a difference out there, we must show up, we must connect, we must engage. And there's so many platforms that's been developed to bring us just as academics and students together. And when we have that little partnership going, then we can reach out to society and say, okay, we've got our house in order. Now please take us into your order and show us how we can be based of service. So it's important those relationships are built on trust and work with people. And trust is a very dicey concept because it takes so long to build the trust between each other and yet trust can be lost in a second. And then we have this issue of collective self-determination. So here comes this process of what's in it for me? What do we share as a vision? And are we self-determined to take up this responsibility and to lead from where I am? Not to tell people or to manage people, but everybody must lead with where they can lead. Now, the first four deals with process, as I've indicated, and the last five is sort of more, what's the engagement for success? How do I succeed with engagement? And so here comes the partnerships. The partnerships with the community, and you've seen there are nine key features for them. Then we need to recognize and respect diversity. So here diversity comes, can you see, even in the succeeding process, the post-process, during the process, before I make contact with my community, whether it's scholar community, whether it's civil society. And then, of course, I need to make sure that I can sustain my engagement. And that to sustain it means we must work with what we have. What is our asset? Not always what is the deficit. That's what we're going to address together. But we first need to see what is it that we have? What is it that we can each contribute? And once we've put all of that in the hat, we can fill the gap as to what else needs to be done. And after that, we can affect change. So that in the end, here comes the ninth and the most important one, it must be long-term. But now, if we have the principles and the values and the features, how do we quality assure it? How do we say, Yes, there's tick, tick, I've done, I tick all the boxes on the principles, I tick all the boxes, there's agenda and minutes and everything that proves that I've got people, that it has input, etc. But how do I, how do I actually prove that it's of good value, that it's of good quality? Now, I would like to share with you 10 overall quality standards, and I've shared the 10 quality standards in a, in a very nice session of webinars that Provahi has done at CHS faculty where she asked people to come and present about community engagement models. What, what sort of approaches do we follow? 
we we presented on a project, but we said we presented that project with community members by also showing and with the community members having these 10 overarching or overall quality standards that we want to work with. And so the first one that we need to do is to look at the involvement standard. So we said it must be inclusive, must be together, must be shared, etc. So how do I ensure for the involvement standard? And so under each one of these 10 standards, I put a small sentence up. How do I do it? We will do it by means of identifying and involving people and organizations. So that we can all invest together and focus together on the engagement. The next standard we have is the support standard. Colleagues, in everything, we know it. When the going gets tough, that's when we need each other. So how will we identify Where's our weakest link, so to speak? And how are we there for each other, to support each other? And I think DVC has in indicated it so well this morning when she used the example of what we had to do since last year to make sure as a university, we unite and we still offer the curriculum and the programs that our students so desperately want to start having a future one day. And then we have the planning standard. So the planning standard, there's lots to do. We need to set goals. We need to set objectives. We need to set time scales. And so some of the uh, attendees this morning, I can see you, even if I can't really see you, I can see your smiles on your faces when we do log frames and how you as community members even show how you can, with all your community projects, show the measurable, outcomes of an initiative. And then of course, we need to have a methods standard. So we need to have a method of how we're going to do it. And so it can be even in a philosophical or a strategic manner, just like Kovachi earlier on asked, how do we take it to faculty level? How do we bring it, as DBC said, our engagement into our governance structures? What's our method? How, how do we still make it happen? And then our fifth standard is the working together standard. And so it comes back to our principles and our values and how we need to be aware of the power dynamic and the diversity issues, etc. And then the sixth standard, hmm, sharing the information standard. So these are the platforms like this academic week, like the upcoming community engagement colloquium, the database that we have via community engagement unit on our scholarship of engagement, our media, all our forms of sharing what we do collectively together. I think sometimes we in the past failed to share enough information and then all of a sudden when we were disconnected to be in physical contact with each other, we realized how important it is to use technology to stay in touch but by staying in touch, we started sharing information. And so it's important that we share the information about the project, about the participants, about the benefits. And it must be a continuous process, colleagues. We can't not do it or say in the beginning and in the end, we do a close out report or we do a nice uh, presentation and that's it. Then we need to work with others standard. What is the work with others standard? It is, how do I identify and overcome the barriers, those challenges that we're up against? How do we overcome it collectively? Because individually, I can't make it. There's the African proverb of, if you want to walk fast, you can walk alone. Then you'll walk fast. But if you want to go far, if you want to walk far, you must walk together. And so our second last one is the improvement standard because it's always about raising the bar, as some of our community members in the substance abuse course always say. Let's raise the bar. We want to be better and the best I could ever be. And you know, colleagues, when we're in a collective environment, I think I am the best I can be because I think that's my only potential. But when we share that potential, it's amazing how we discover our own potential that's beyond our own imagination. 
And that's where that secular return of the partnership comes. And then our second last standard is where we look at the feedback standard. Now, this is what we call sometimes evaluation, but it's also, we had a lovely session yesterday in the Department of Social Work about how do we, how do we take on this transformation? What is transformation in the department, in us as staff, in the curriculum? And we realized that it's so important that feedback, how things make us feel, how the critique works. And that critique is something that makes us grow. It is not something that shows us that it's inadequate or what was lacking. It is how we can, just like the previous standard say, how do we improve? We need to allow ourselves to get the feedback. And the feedback must come from the recipient, the target group, because they're the ones that can say, yes, you were on point or no, you were not. And then last but not least, monitoring and evaluation stand. Have I set myself key indicators that I can measure? Are they smart indicators? Are they specific, measurable, attainable, et cetera, so that I can collect evidence and prove not just on a tick list, but with research data that there's a change. And colleagues don't think that monitoring and evaluation, all these 10 standards, is not possible even with a school group of kids in primary school. We all know what we want in life. We are not with our goals. We are not with our dreams. So it is possible to do it collectively. And I hope that we all take some of this in the back of our minds and that we start enjoying this journey towards creating engaged community partnerships. And that we share when we now hear from Andriette and her group a prime example of how we can collectively be better. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Kunal, for subject matter that can be very technical sometimes. You made excellent uh, examples. Thank you so much. So please, mm -hmm. everybody, keep your questions and discussions uh, for after the next presenter. Also, feel free to add and and chat within the in the chat room so right now i would like to um welcome uh, miss henry Hitt Weber from the center of performing arts and i know henry Hitt will um introduce us to her co-presenters henry Hitt. good morning everyone and thank you pearl first of all thank you to professor priscilla daniels for this kind invitation to be here this morning you know, my many years, 10 years that I'm at UDUBS now, there's so many wonderful projects that's being run by the Community Engagement Unit. And I'm very humbled and grateful to be selected to present our story of partnership this morning. And so partnership and collaboration is a journey together, and it's not a destination once you have the partner, once you have the funds or all the haves, it is, that's only the start of the partnership journey. And so our example, our model is not the beginning all and begin all and end all of it. It is something that develops as we grow within the relationship. So uh, I would like to ask my two co, uh, my partners in crime in the music for special needs, uh, Vera and Lindell to please um, share, to share their, their photos so we can see who they are. Uh, Vera Peterson is the manager responsible for administration and fundraising at the Athlone School for the Blind Association. And um, she's also a teacher by profession. Lyndall Johnson is the occupational therapist at the Oasis Special School. And uh, thank you ladies for joining us in this conversation this morning. Um, we can go to the first slide, please, um, Cornell. Good. Let me bring up yours for you, seeing that we've just met all your colleagues. Yep. The next Go. one. <clears throat> right. So this uh, collaboration and partnership um, in special needs uh, music was something new to all of us because we come from the music background. But this all became part uh, when Fees Must Fall happened in 2016. 
I remember it was a Tuesday afternoon about four o'clock when the communication came through and we had classes the next day and where are we going to do this? And so it was a call to Vera who put all the things in place via the board and the school and gave us space to work for uh, basically three months from September to November of 2016 and get all our academics, exams, everything done on time in the normal time frame. And during this time, I shared a desk or I was at a desk in Vera's office. That was my office during uh, the shutdown. And it was just seeing what the kids were doing in the, in the area. And by November, when our exams are done and all the hustle and bustle was over, I said to Vera, what is happening for music? for the visually impaired learners. And there wasn't a plan or, or anything in the planning. And so we took this idea to the board and the principal and the larger community, the stakeholder involvement, just to get a buy-in. And that was the start of getting that interaction going. And then to make this possible, we need funding. We can go to the next slide, please, Cornell. So it was that we had an existing partnership with the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sport uh, for a three-year project for the Center for Performing Arts for community students. And I was in the corridors and I bumped into the director and I said, you know, you guys are not doing anything more for special needs. What can we do? The year's a project, the year's a vision, we've got the buy-in. And I was invited to the director's office it so happened, she said, how much do you want? I said, no, it's not about how much do you want. This is the first, you don't, because you're in a partnership, you don't take advantage of your donors. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I will bring all the parties together, which was the board of the Athlone School for the Blind and myself, and mm -hmm. we all met with DCAS. We walked out of that meeting with 50,000 donation for teacher, teachers and instruments, and later on that, it was only for a one year pilot. And after that, we had the donation from Mrs. Wendy Ackerman, which is also, it is once you sustain or you develop something that people like and you report on what you are doing, the kids' faces can tell more than what our project entails. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to hand over to Vera Peterson because this is where the connect happens. It is with early childhood development. We needed to start there for two reasons. One was that if we go into the grade one to grade 12 uh, grades at the school, mm -hmm. then, then it becomes WCED. Mm -hmm. DCAS would fund an association and it would fund ECD because it didn't fall within WCED. Mm -hmm. That's just the understanding of why we started there. When the program developed and when the uh, funding changed we could then go into instrumental teaching and a music therapist so um vera before we go to the pictures one um please give us the um how the school for the blind viewed this partnership how it grew because mm -hmm. it's always better when i own it in a way that it came to the school but is this ownership and this joint collaboration beneficial to the school? How you gave your input to direct us mm. and we could make this program possible, which is now five years old. Mm. Vera Peterson. Thank you very much, Enred. And uh, um, thank you very much to your colleagues as well for the invitation. I'm very privileged to be part of this discussion. Um, just a little bit of background about the Athlone School for the Blind Association. The association, in 1927, which is 94 years ago, started the first school for blind children of color because a school of that nature did not exist. We started with seven learners. Today, we've got 250 learners uh, who are blind, visually impaired, and some of them with multiple disabilities. And we have two hostels where we have 125 learners uh, who, who live on site. We've got a, a team of support staff on site. Our curriculum is exactly the same as in mainstream schools as per WCED's norms and standards. 
Um, I want to start off by saying, uh, with all due respect, uh, when Enriet and I spoke about um, a relationship um, regarding music uh, and ECD, I was a little bit skeptical in the beginning. Uh, being a non-profit organization, one becomes very accustomed to people, or shall I say volunteers, who visit the school, uh, raise expectations of the children about wanting to volunteer their services, uh, they're there for a short while and then they move on after their feel-good experience with UWs, with the music program, with Henriette and her team, it was completely different. Um, it, it was a situation where they embraced the entire, they, uh, they understood the challenges that they would be facing, these are blind children. Uh, they understood the fact that there were other uh, factors at play that they would have to overcome. It was a collaborative experience. Uh, uh, they worked very, very closely with the ECD staff, uh, uh, the school and, and, and ourselves. Um, and the program, I'm, I'm trying to look at my clock the same time and, and make sure I don't go over my time because I tend to talk too much. It, um, the most important thing to us was the fact that music, the music program was not an add-on. It was integrated into the curriculum. It became part of the ECD curriculum and it made an, it had an enormous effect on the learners. We had learners in ECD who had um, other disabilities such as autism. Uh, and because they were blind, the other senses were heightened. And Anel Galvin, who worked with them, as you can see on those pictures, had the ability to focus on the other senses and, and bring out the best in the children. In fact, it became very problematic for us because after every music uh, session, when the kids went, learners went back to class, they refused to settle down. They wanted to go back for another session of music. And for that, we are eternally grateful. We five, I think uh, we are five years down the line. It has been a long-term partnership. It's enhanced our program tremendously. Uh, uh, um, it, it has made our kids feel special. It has made them realize they are not disabled. They're just differently abled. I think I've, I've, I've done my five minutes, Henriette. I've been watching the clock. Let me unmute myself. Thank you so much, Vera. Uh, uh, I would like to guide you just through the photos. The photo on the yes. left is the day that we received the instruments. Um, the gentleman there is Walt Hoyer from Hoyer in Stanabosch who delivered the instruments. And uh, that was the fun the kids were having. You'll see later of Daniels and I were having some fun too. Um, what you see were the pictures, the quavers, the, the uh, two quavers, the tate. It is pool noodle and sucker sticks. Mm -hmm. And the kids made it themselves with a nailed help. So you get the feel of it, you get to play, yeah, yeah. you get to understand the note values and all those. And then the photo on the right is a student intern we had from uh, Boston. She was a member of the Boston City Singers who toured. And then she came back as an intern to work at the School for the Blind. Mm. So this happened for 2017. And the next slide, please, Cornell, is where the partnership developed into a um, the DVC Academic mm. Partnership Award. This was also a, a big turning point, both for the center where we were acknowledged for doing something that is totally out of our scope, which is music for disabled kids. And now nor I had any background to this prior to engaging with the School for the Blind. And that is uh, the chairman of the board with some of the teachers of the school as mm -hmm. well as Anel with a hand in the air, who, was the, who put all of these things together for us. And um, then we had some fun Prof Daniels and I with some of the instruments on the other side. Vera, what did this engagement and even more so the partnership award? I know there was a big, besides us having a party, um, the school also acknowledged the students in assemblies and so on. But Absolutely. Uh, going forward as well, what, what did that mean? Absolutely. Uh, uh, the principal received the award uh, on, on behalf of the school at, at uh, UWC and then, and then presented the, the award at an assembly which we, which we had. Um, what was so amazing was um, 
many of our kids because of their disability and they live in a very we live in a very cruel society where people are very judgmental this award made each child who participated in that program feel so special each child each learner who was part of the program felt that that award was meant for him or her and for the the ECD teacher said to me that um it was almost as if when, when you were a blind child, you, you, when you are born blind, you believe that everybody is, is blind. And for the first time, it was almost as if our children felt that they were recognized, they were acknowledged, they were seen for who they were. So this certificate to me symbolizes the restoration of the self-worth and the dignity of each of our children at the Athlone School for the Blind. And, and for that, we are eternally grateful. It is in the pride of place uh, uh, at school. Uh, the learners refuse to allow, allow it to be in the principal's office. So it is hanging in the foyer in a gilded frame where uh, um, we acknowledge it at every opportunity that we have. Thank you, Henriette. Henry Hitt, you're on mute. Sorry for that. Um, the, the next slide is our ASA Special School and I would like Lyndall to, um, to start the conversation because this was a different approach into mm. the partnership. Lyndall? Thank you so much, Henry Hitt, and thank you, UWC, for this opportunity. Uh, to showcase and share our partnership with, um, with the Center of the Arts, uh, for Performing Arts. Um, Cornell, can I have the next slide, please? I just want to share quickly. Um, our ACES Special School is a school for children with intellectual disability. And the main focus of our school and education for special needs is that we want to create equal opportunities and access for um, learners with disabilities and also to create an environment for inclusivity. And so um, it, was, it was quite a, a, a spark to connect with, with the university because it is right on our doorstep. We didn't know of each other, even though I'm an alumni of UWC as well. Um, it was, it, and it just shows that we can, um, you know, create partnerships with people right um, like a stone throw away from you as well. And then our curriculum we, we follow is a bit different to the mainstream school. It is more the CAPS for SID, so it was a differentiated curriculum. And um, we have grades one to grade five, even though our learners are here until the age of 50, uh, 18. And the, the, the areas we, we service is your Delft, your Belleville, your West Bank and Easter of the Altus River. So it's your typical for socioeconomic areas. And so in these areas, you will find that most of the kids probably will, wouldn't, would not have seen a record or any instrument um, for, in, in, uh, for that matter. So if I can go into the next slide, um, I'm an occupational therapist by profession and, and um, my focus on my role um, in the education sector is to collaborate and to network with, with stakeholders and also to enhance the learner's learning, um, learning journey because we all know that um, our, there's, a, there's, there's a high rate of youth unemployment and even more so for children with um, intellectual disability. And then also to change perceptions about people, um, the, the abilities that people with disabilities have um, and to change the perspective of communities. And so we look at the person, the environment and the occupation and also how we can increase the occupational performance. And then we can move on to the next slide, which is how did this love story begin between uh, the Center of Performing Arts and, and Oasis? And it, it, it really worked. It really started with our school concert that we have um, annually. Uh, in 2018, and myself, I'm very involved in terms of choreography and um, logistics and so on. And I got the idea that we we need to connect 
with with um, UWC and the Center for Performing Arts, I bravely picked up the phone and I didn't know anyone from the department. I got in touch with, with Henry Hitt, um, and proposing to her that she they join us to assist us with our concert. And um, Henry Hitt told me, Linda, I don't do concerts, <laughs> uh, but what I can <laughs> what I can do for you is let's form a partnership you know, uh, um, with, with you. And so the learners can develop a skill rather than something that is unsustainable. Um, and so I, 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 I didn't want to just do, you, you know, you don't want to shoot down any idea. So we were really open to the situation and we then scheduled some meetings with the school principal, with myself and, and Henriette. And we really shared our, our visions um, and, and, and our dreams as to what we want to do and where we see this and how both uh, parties can have a win-win situation in this regard. And then I want to go on to the next slide quickly. Um, as you know, there's no blueprint really for um, starting or, or, or having a music program for children with severe intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. And our journey was a bit different to that of, of Athens School of the Blind. They've got visually impaired and we've got cognitively impaired. So there is no blueprint. And I just want to draw your quick attention to the four quadrants that we developed and we established in this partnership. And number one was the learner selection process. So it wasn't one person doing the selection, it was a joint selection with, with a partnership with uh, um, the Center of Performing Arts. And we put our combined professional judgment together in the selection. We started off with a hundred learners that was referred by teachers. And um, then we moved on to grouping them together in the sifting process. And we selected children based on their motivation, their interest, and also their prognosis to learn a new skill. And then uh, the informal, we did informal assessments. It wasn't your typical auditions. We did simulated tasks, so simulated uh, experience for learners. We would put out different instruments and we had the learners engage in them. We set out sequenced, uh, um, a sequence coordination where they were into dance and singing and so on. And we basically assessed whether the learners had an aptitude for music. Mm -hmm. And then, we moved on to the structure, and this is where the, the, the talk and collaboration came in between the two institutions, where we looked at um, which days will be, uh, the, the program will, will happen, which venue we will use, and, and how we can integrate it into, into the school program. Um, and also what the school already have in terms of music uh, instruments. And then uh, Henry then came along and to say, what we we uh, can what we need extra to that and then the magic happened when we had to look at what how much percent theory we will do and how much percent practicals with our kids are practical learners we use colors we use all our senses because our our learners really need to work through with all our senses we use movement hand over hand proprioceptive input um, and as as uh, and now also came along there with really adapting the, the the music and really getting down and dirty. If you haven't seen Anel, that is her on the floor there on, on the pictures working with our Down syndrome learners and really getting down and and you can see the engagement, eye contact that the learners are making right there. So it was a really exciting experience and where we could really work um, inter interdisciplinary with music, the music uh, teacher, which was a now, which was a uh, uh, rate and, and the coordination as well as myself as the OT. So it was a fun experience, this um, partnership, really. Henriette, you on mute? I realize that. Thank you, Lyndall. Um, we're going to conclude now and come through, but uh, you can proceed with, uh, with just um, uh, uh, changing the slides while I continue through this, Cornell. Um, a year prior to the photos we are seeing, um, Rick Keskera is a uh, conductor, a trumpeter in the Brussels Philharmonic, and he visited the School for the Blind um, in 2018. 
And he also has a project called the Art of Music, which is uh, an NPO. And in his personal capacity, he raised the funds to purchase the instruments um, that you see. And there was a handover ceremony at the Center for the Performing Arts, mm -hmm. but he also went to engage with the students with uh, teaching and collaborating um, for a day at the School for the Blind, as well as at the Oasis uh, Special School, where we see him uh, together playing recorder. Trumpet mm -hmm. is his instrument, but he joined in playing recorder with the kids and Anals, uh, joining Anals lesson uh, at the, at the uh, Oasis school. Mm. So that is how it started very small, as we said, um, with myself and Vera in the office and watching kids running around in the play area and how it developed to grow into Oasis, which is a different type of special need learner. And then that a visit to these projects gave rise to internationalization, where a, a partner becomes a donor to, and bringing together the consulates of Belgium and getting the donor and those representatives were at the handover ceremony as well. And so in conclusion, thank you to my two colleagues, Vera and Lyndall. Um, Professor Priscilla Daniels has been on a journey with me since day one. It is now 10 years later, Prof and it is um, just growing as, as we develop and even more now uh, that the Center for Performing Arts for the last two years uh, is located within the DBC academic office and, uh, and the line and uh, Prof Daniels and I are working even closer together within that line. And throughout our presentations, how we've gone online with community music uh, Terence Pretorius needs a special mention. He's a, um, what do you call this, an uh, 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 honorary CPA colleague now. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, Henry Head, uh, Vera and Lyndall. That was, uh, you guys are doing amazing work. Thank you so much. So we'll go straight into uh, questions and comments. Once again, you can raise your hands or you can just uh, put your comments or questions within the chat. Juliet. Thank you, Paul. Um, no, I just, just a comment. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe and I don't think, you know, these words to express when you listen to all this um, effort and just the collaboration. It's, it's just awesome, you know, and I think words will just diminish what, what I'm trying to express, but just to tell him the yet and, and Priscilla and all of you and, and the partners that they're working with. I think there's a special place in heaven just for people that do this kind of work and, and the sustainability of the work, not just feeling good about it, you know? Some of us would want it for a CV, you know, or a road show, but yeah. just sustainability around it. You know, I, I think there's a special place, Vera, for you and everybody else. Um, because it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. I have two comments to make. Just to say that, Vera, you had me in tears when you spoke about, um, you know, how the award uh, was received. You know, I started this um, Academic Achievers, uh, the reward and recognition at UWC uh, in 2017, and then was with the school's recognition event. And one never knows how it is received on the other side. Sometimes you, you hear it from people, um, but it was for, for us having made the community engagement, our excellent, uh, excellence in the community engagement part of partners, part of those school recognition events, I've, I've now really today realized that inadvertently um, there are other, there's a, a different impact than, than just the mere fact of, of the recognition and how it actually lands um, in, the, in the hands of the recipients. So thank you very much for, for, um, for clarifying that and, and for expressing yourself the way you've done. I've really also enjoyed Lindell's um, because I've been there when, when the instruments were, were handed over at the CPA when Rick was here and I've heard the kids um, play. Um, and it's really so nice for me to, 
to see um, and to hear it from the other perspective and not from a UWC part. It's also for me showcasing that it's not about a handout. Mm -hmm. And and Henriette is so right there that it's about the sustainability of that partnership. And this is the second point I want to make is that as you were talking, I was thinking, um, goodness, we should actually now that we are doing our curriculum development for um, a BA in performing arts at UWC, we, we should be thinking of our inclusive education part and, and how we can expand this beyond music into other forms of performing arts, such as um, drama and dance and, and that kind of thing, because that's what, what we are working on um, in our curriculum development at the moment at the center. So I think, watch this space, it's, it's gonna become even more exciting, I think. And um, once we've got the program and now we can strengthen our partners, then one can actually fundraise for this. I think it's 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 well worth uh, putting some some work into it so that we can fundraise for it. Sorry, I think I was on mute earlier on. Is there any questions for uh, Henry Hett, uh, Vera Lindell, uh, or Cornell? And please remember, you can also place any comments or questions within the chat. Um, I'll give you about, we're slightly over time, but you know, I'll give you two more minutes, or even if Henry Hett, if, if you wanted to comment. Thank you, Paul. I think it, uh, a lot of the success, and it's something that um, Cornell mentioned earlier, it was its communication and collaboration and being flexible. And um, the changing dynamics of schools change. COVID has put, made that even exacerbated that. Um, but it is the working together with colleagues like Vera and Lyndall. It is an ongoing communication. And you see the difference in the children. I mean, uh, um, at the time I was at the school as much as, at the schools as much as I was at the center. And the, mm -hmm. the kids interaction with not only the music program, but the, with the staff coming in, we had some students uh, um, doing some work within the school as well. And they were getting almost hands-on in-service training without being uh, uh, knowing what, what we were trying to engage them in. And so collectively, it was always in both from the schools, Linda or um, Vera would say, can we do this? But this is what's happening here. And we will try and adapt and make that. And it would work the same way if I get a bright spark and I send a WhatsApp to, to Vera. It was that type of interaction, uh, communication, collaboration, um, adapting to the changing uh, world. And even now we're looking at we're getting our online system for our current students. How do we move online? Because uh, I think Vera needs to come in here just very briefly on how difficult it was for ECD learners on the transport that they get to the school for us to have any, even a, a intervention during COVID. Um, we had some distance learning program working with Lindell for a time, but that wasn't sustained into the second semester of 2020. But um, just from the school perspective, how difficult it was, if we, I'm not seeing Vera, if Vera could come on just for, during COVID, the challenges that the school had. I'm not sure is if Vera's still around. Is Vera gone? I think she's in tears after what Prof Lovac said. If I know Vera well enough, <laughs> because I look, I saw her looking up at the sky, and that's normally a sign that uh, Vera became a bit emotional. But uh, uh, it was a challenge, and and um, it is something that we are now looking at um, in going forward. How do we assist on the online platform via the school to get our our special needs learners uh, involved in in the longer term? But uh, that that's my comment, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Henry Hett and uh, Lyndall and Vera. And again, thank you very much, uh, Kunal. Uh, you made, um, again, a topic that can be very technical, 
very practical and very enjoyable to listen to. So right now I would like to introduce um, Pro Professor Priscilla Daniels, Director of Community Engagement, and she'll be speaking about the way forward and closing. I was just getting my, my video uh, ready so that you can see my face. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much. I am, I don't want to say overwhelmed, I'm inspired, I, I'm challenged. I, there are just so many feelings at the moment because it was such an amazing morning. Um, I, I, in this process that we are now, and um, based on the globalization situation we have, um, before COVID, but now with the pandemic, our world has really shrunk. And I think what was amazing about all the discussions today is Prof. Levesque set the scene um, and what is our mission and vision and gave us an idea of what is the important aspects she linked it uh, to our policies and then said what we would do in, in the university. Um, I think that Fedoza made a good point um, and spoke about the governance. And um, I think that that um, is some of the points that we need to talk about, how we're going to do the communication, how we're going to look at governance and, and um, you know, and Prof has a plan and, and, and we will, as a community uh, of, of uh, practitioners uh, contribute to it. And one of the nice things is that this, it's always a, a kind of an action research, participatory research. We will implement what she thinks and then we'll give a feedback and we'll improve. Um, secondly, I think what was, was, was great is the way that um, Juliet just gave us such amazing examples and gave us ideas of how things can be done. And I, I was so happy that she could present all the work they do because sometimes I think we are not aware of how much work uh, they do behind the scenes and how much support uh, they provide. And what was great to see in the chat, how people were really affirming uh, the kind of work that has been done. So, so I, I, I am inspired and I again want to say thank you to, to Juliet for helping us and even especially with our community members. And I want to do a shout out for all our students, our community members and Cornell students. Um, you know, I, I, I attacked me to Cornell's presentation where she presented those rules of engagement. And I think we try to shy away from the rules, but the rules and the spaces we create so that we ensure that we are clear about what the roles and expectations are is what will ensure that we have sustainable partnerships. Uh, we have to learn from the lessons that we've had in the past is that a lot of partnerships are based on people, but we also know that people leave. So we have to have a formal system in place that protects that partnership when the champions and the people who drive it leave. Um, so thank you for that, Kunal. I think, I think that was great. I loved how you took it from values because again, I wanna say this kind of work is not for the faint hearted. Like uh, our leadership in Prof uh, Levesque shows us, you have to have a passion. You have to have it part of your value system. You must live it. Um, and so I'm glad Kunal started at the values and I think the students will be happy to see that she did talk about that indicator so that uh, if we want uh, the scholarship of engagement to get the recognition and respect, then we have to evaluate what we are doing and do the quality assurance. So I'm, I'm also very grateful for you for putting that out. And then lastly, Henriette, you know, you, you, um, you had us all in tears and you had us all just... Uh, I think you affirmed why we're doing this work. Um, I, I think it's very important that we get reminded because doing this kind of work has a lot of challenges. Um, it's sometimes a lot of work that, uh, you know, you don't get paid for. That is why the passion and the values have to be there. So I am very grateful for everybody. And I want, I want to say thank you, uh, to everybody who made the time on a Friday morning to be here uh, um, and to be part of this conversation. 
this is not a conversation that is that is going to 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 end here um, as Cornell has alluded to and I also now want to invite you and tell you to watch out for our invitations in October we are going to have the colloquium um, and I think it's very important that we take this conversation forward um, so that we come up with the ideas and we incorporate some of your recommendations so even uh, when you leave here yeah, and you reflect on the session you are most welcome to send us some suggestions based on this if you think that these are some of the things we need to incorporate in our discussions or what we need to take forward in our colloquium. Um, the colloquium is, uh, uh, we are going to do it virtually like the boss says, more people can come, um, but we want to do it in the afternoon sessions. And it's so interesting that Prof Lovac said about time zones. And I want to say, we're going to do the two to four slot. Reason being that we want our international partners to present and to be part of the process. And because of that, I must not talk to my boss, but I'm going to say we are hoping that we can then do it, um, not just on one day, but do it uh, on in the afternoons of, of, two, uh, of the 27th and the 28th too. And also we know that uh, people are busy in the morning teaching and all of that. And so that might make it difficult for them to attend. So I hope that you will be able to uh, be part of that process. But then it brings me to the point just to say uh, thank you to Prof. Lovac. Um, she's our uh, leader in all of this. Um, and she leads uh, by example. And I thank her for that. I, I can never say I don't have a support. I want to thank her for staying. Um, and I know that's part of a passion. I want to really thank Kunal for uh, putting uh, the system in place, for letting us use a Zoom and uh, for organizing all of that. Kunal, I, I really appreciate your commitment. I, I know you don't sleep. You used to sleep four hours. I don't think you sleep anymore. So um, I don't know how you end up looking so beautiful. I told you this morning when you had the dry run, I said, Kunal, I think you don't sleep. You just kind of paste. I'm wondering whether you paste a face on your face so that you can look like this because look at me I look terrible anyway so I want to say thank you to you I know that this is not part of your work this is your extra work um, I, I think uh, in the end you will be rewarded when you leave this earth for all this work you're doing um, I want to thank Paul uh, you know Prof was saying Paul you are amazing and I said to her I am very privileged to have you on my team um, so thank you for, for guiding us and keeping us on time because people are busy and they don't want to uh, be left behind. So thank you for that. Um, and I also want to thank my CEU team. They were all here um, uh, for supporting us. And then I want to just uh, um, uh, thank all our champions, you know, uh, like people like Fedoza and uh, people um, in the community, in health sciences, in pharmacy, all of those people who are the champions because um, community engagement and the scholarship of engagement is hard work. And it is a space where we're doing a lot of work, but it's also exciting because now we can create something that we know is of value and relevant in, in these spaces. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Thank you for contributing to this amazing discussion. And I also just want to remind you that we do have a beautiful concert that um, is going to happen later today um, and that Henriette and her team has put together. So please come and listen to some music and relax. Um, and please have a, a good weekend and Let's stay connected and build those relationships.